And now, the starting lineup of your favorite show. At producer, 5'11", from Blanchester. The Cow Killer, Casey McCollister. And comic engineer, standing at 4'8", the pride of the west side. Elliot Rearing. Yo, yo, yo! Hello and welcome in to Off the Bench, presented by United Dairy Farmers. I'm your host for a little while longer, Reed Mouse. We have uh, we have a good show for you today. We're going to have Paul Fritschner checking in from Madison Square Garden later on today as Xavier takes on UConn at noon. Um, UC got another big win in the Big 12 tournament, and of course, the Cincinnati Bengals made a couple of big moves. I believe this might be my last day hosting. Tom will be in this chair tomorrow because of Miami obligations. So thank you to Tom for filling in. I don't know if I'm hosting on Monday, but whether it's my last show or not, I've had a lot of fun doing this and let's go ahead and uh, dive in because earlier this week, I talked about someone that I formerly didn't like, right? I wanted not to like him. And against my better efforts to probably unjustifically not not like him, his resilience, his spunk, his grit, his play, made me actually end up a bit admiring him. That's Baker Mayfield. Today I'm going to talk about a person that I wanted to like. I thought he got a bad rap in the media. I thought he was being torn down for different reasons, for for being different, and he was. He was being torn down for being different. But the more information, the more news, the more headlines that come out, the more and more it just becomes exhausting hearing this person's name. And that, of course, is the starting quarterback for the New York Jets, Aaron Rodgers. A couple days ago, a news report came out that Robert Kennedy Jr., who's running for president, um, was eyeing two different VP guys. One was former governor, former wrestler, Jesse Ventura, and the other is quarterback of the New York Jets, Aaron Rodgers. And I don't know if Aaron actually talked to RFK Jr., Bobby Kennedy Jr., or not about this. And and that's not the point. And I'm not going to do a political thing. I don't want to do it. You guys don't want to hear me talk about it. So I'm just, I'm simply not going to do it. But can we agree on something that RFK, and once again, if you want to vote for him, do it. Freedom, it's your, your thing. That RFK is a bit of a conspiracy theorist. I mean, the, the two guys that he has running with him, one is Jesse Ventura that I mentioned, who was the former governor, former wrestler, and used to host a TV show on True TV called Conspiracy Theories with Jesse Ventura. And then the others, Aaron Rodgers, who notably uh, doesn't believe in the Sandy Hook shooting, thinks that it was an inside job. Once again, neither here nor there. Two months ago, Aaron Rodgers said that he wants to get all the noise out of the locker room, wants to focus on football, then this comes out. And once again, it might not be, like Aaron might have nothing to do with this. But the point is that you can't say that you want to focus on football and continue to put yourself in the positions that Aaron has where auxiliary things come in. You can't be that divisive of a figure. Listen, people don't hate Aaron Rodgers because the media tells them to. Maybe they used to. People hate Aaron Rodgers because he consistently insists that he's the smartest person in the room, right? We all know people like that. I act like that at times. Think about your life. And think about people that always say, I'm so smart, I'm so... Think about the relationships that you see on social media that always post how in love they are. Do those work out a whole lot? Do you think those people are actually happy? I don't know. Seems to be a correlation between the people that always post about their relationship and how happy they are and they don't seem to work out. Think about some of the parents that you know. You get on Facebook. Oh my God, my, my sons love my life, my, my daughter. They're, they're, they're so great, they're so great, they're so great, which is great, right? Sh- p- parents should be proud of their family, their kids. But don't you see a lot of parents like that that always post about their, 
their kids and you go like, you're not a, you're not a great parent. I've seen the way yeah, you're not a great parent. You probably all have a coworker constantly insist. I work so hard. I'm, I'm such a hard worker. And you, in the back of your mind, you're like, that person's kind of lazy. The hard workers just, just work hard. Think about all these things. Like the, the person that I'm so nice. I'm so nice to people. You're kind of, you're kind of not. That's Aaron Rodgers. That is Aaron Rodgers. The, the, the ayahuasca, the darkness retreat, how quirky he is and all that stuff. It just adds in that Aaron Rodgers keeps insisting that he's the smartest person in the room. And that's why people don't like him. That's why. And let's take into the fact of how smart he is in terms of football sense, right? A few years ago, we saw Tom Brady, the GOAT, the greatest quarterback ever. He left his team that he had a dynasty with. And everyone's like, what is he doing? He's going to go to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers? Well, Tampa Bay Buccaneers had a, had a really good offensive head coach. They had really good weapons, really good line. Pretty much a complete team. They just needed a quarterback. Went to the NFC. Went to a bad division. What did Aaron Rodgers do? He goes from the NFC to the tougher AFC. Goes from the NFC North to the AFC East with Josh Allen and the Miami Dolphins. And he goes to Robert Sala, who's the defensive head coach, and he doesn't have a whole lot of weapons. We'll see how it all pans out, but for someone that is consistently saying how smart he is, doesn't appear to be that smart. All right, Casey. Oh, baby. Oh, baby. Oh, baby, right after the monologue. I didn't want to interrupt you. No, that's good. That's good. That's good. What we got? It was like right at the top as soon as you started getting into it. They officially signed Von Bell. One year league minimum deal for the Bengals. The other 5.9 or whatever million dollars that uh, is owed to him is getting paid by the Panthers. So, good deal for the Bengals. So, how much again was it? Sorry. So, the deal is a one-year $6 million deal, but we're only paying him the league minimum because the Panthers are paying the other part of it. Okay. Well, that's so. – I We'll get into all the Bengals stuff. We'll, we've done a lot of Bengals stuff over the last few days, and there's huge Bengals news, and I really want to dive in deep. But also, it's conference tournament time, so I want to give UC – Xavier, uh, their flowers before uh, before we get into the Bengals stuff, which will mostly be in the second hour, and we'll have call-ins and all that stuff. But uh, Casey McAllister, nice to have you on the show today. It's nice, nice being. You know what? You're a handsome son of a gun, Casey. <laughs> Me? Yeah. Me? Yeah. You. Oh, yeah thank you, you, Reed. You're not too bad yourself. Thank you. Thank you. All right, what do we got in the world of sports, Case? Uh, world of sports. Um, I actually don't have a ton in terms of headlines today. Uh, mainly some college basketball news. I have a little Reds and some uh, NFL stuff here and there. I'll jump right into it. Yeah. Cincinnati Bearcats, they take care of business. They get the job done down the stretch against the Kansas City Jayhawks, Kansas City, Kansas Jayhawks, and they now move on to the quarterfinals against the Baylor Bears. I believe the game was at like 40 to 34 when I was watching at one point, and they ended up rallying back. Um, I mean, I guess it's not really a rally, but they ended up winning seventy-two to fifty-seven. What a great, what a great game by by UC. I mean, they were two and a half point favorites, and I think the the idea was like, why in the world is are the Bearcats favored against Kansas? Well, Kansas was missing two of their best players, and it, you know the Bearcats did a fantastic. I mean, neither team shot well, both shooting under forty percent, both shooting mid thirties and whatnot. But you know, you hold a team like Kansas down to fifty-two points. Uh, Sean Spurlock had a really fun stat for me. He told me before the show, he's like, hey, I'm going to give you some insider information. I was like, sling it my way. Come on, give, give me some of it. Give me it. Come on, I'm fiending. And he said, at the moment, I haven't fact-checked this, so if it's wrong, call out Mr. Spurlock. He said, at the moment, UC sits 34th in the net. The lowest team to ever, the only team that has had a lower net ranking that has not made the tournament was 2019 NC State. Now, UC is 34th right now. That NC State Wolfpack were 33rd. We're talking about what the Bearcats need to do tonight. A lot of people think that if they win tonight, they, they put themselves in pretty good position. I was told before the week that they needed to get to the championship. We'll see how it all plays out. But you got to think that if UC wins tonight and they jump from 34th, over 33rd, which once again, that was what NC State was back in 2019 when they didn't make the tournament. So great night there from, from UC. I was thinking about 
And also, I was like, man, let's get Elliot on, right? Let's yeah. get let's get Elliot on the thing. But last time, I brought him on the show. He called me. He basically called me everything but a slur. So I was like, all right, well, I don't want to do that again. I'm being kidding, of course, guys. I'm kidding. But uh, yeah, it's a great game for for UC. They play at 9:30 tonight in Kansas City. They are our, what five and a half point underdogs against the Baylor Bears. I believe that's right. Six I and believe a half point that's underdogs. right. I believe so that's right. we'll see. We'll see what happens. We'll see if they get it done. It was an exciting game. Pretty much one that they dominated from the, the start of the second half on. And uh, congratulations, the UC Bearcats. They weren't the only team here in Cincinnati that won. Yeah, that's right. The Xavier Musketeers. They also got the job done last night. They won. Ooh, they won. I had it pulled up here just a second ago. They won seventy-six to seventy-two. I believe was the final score. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had a, a members-only live stream yesterday where we were. Uh, had... I was a sharp better in that live stream. <laughs> Weren't you? Weren't we all just really hot on the iron there? Uh, we went like 0 for 4, I believe, on all of our bets. Most of them were against Xavier, so I guess that's kind of uh, the, the the sign that you know you would probably lose if Xavier ended up winning. But um, yeah, it was a it was a sloppy game, I would say, but it was a a, a game that Xavier pulled away from down the stretch. I mean, they were 0 for 8 in threes at the first half. And then they were like seven for seven or six of seven or something like that after in the second half. Yeah, they ended up being seven for for 22. I think they were like seven for their next nine or something like that. Yeah. From three. But it was was an interesting. So just filling you in, um, instead of box lunch yesterday, we said, hey, Xavier plays at four. Let's do a live stream. And we'll uh, we'll watch the game. We'll watch the game together. We we got a 12-pack of Butch Light. It's actually sitting here in the office. And me – Casey, Spur, we all had bets. We're like, hey, we're going to sweat these bets out together. We're going to watch this game. Casey had Butler to get the first to 10. You, or <laughs> Xavier was the first team to 10. I had the first half over. It wasn't even close. The under hit by a mile. Uh, Spur had Butler first half money line. That didn't hit. So then we go into the second half, and I say, all right, let's, uh, let's bet the first team to 40. And uh, we bet. I think we both bet Butler just because it was plus money. And Xavier was the first of 40. And then we're like, all right, I'll, I'll double down one more time. Let's hit the over. It's 154 or whatever. And they didn't come close once again. So uh, it, was a bad, it was a bad time in, in the room, but it was a lot of fun. That was, that was a fun little stream. We got to do more of those live streams. Yeah, it was a fun stream. We, and it wasn't just us two. I mean, there's people in the chat sweating it out. Um, yeah, it was a good time overall. I would uh, 100% do that again. Uh, they move on to play UConn today at 12, right? Yeah, they play at noon. They play at noon. 15-point underdogs. Once again, we will have Pauly Fritschner coming on the show at 1030. He'll be doing it from Madison Square Garden, I presume. I presume. I don't know how close yeah. his hotel is, but uh, he'll, he'll be checking in. And uh, last time the two teams played, it, it wasn't good for the old Muskies. The Muskies haven't been playing expi- inspiring ball over the past month or so, but, um, you know, stranger things have happened. Um, I think the, the bigger no- news from the Big East tournament was DePaul. DePaul, who hasn't won a Big East game all year, almost, almost, so close, almost beat the team that has dominated that conference for a better part of a decade now in Villanova. Um, it, it took a last-second three for the Villanova Wildcats. To, uh, to overcome the Blue Demons. I text Paul. I was like, hey, can you come on the show tomorrow? I'd love to talk Butler or, or love to talk Xavier Butler. And he goes, yeah, absolutely. And then I, I ended the, the text stream and I say, go Blue Demons. They're going to be on top. And I was, I was close. I was close. Very close. Yeah. So we'll have DePaul Frischner on later. And uh, he'll, he'll give us a little bit of a rundown on all things yep. college basketball, I'm sure. But yep. mainly, mainly Xavier, of course. Absolutely. Uh, some teams punched their ticket into the NCAA tournament. McNeese beat Nicholas to win the Southland tournament. Mm. Colgate beat Lay. I want to say that's how you would pronounce it. Lay. Okay. 74 to 55. Lehigh? Lehigh, Is yeah. It, you talking Lehigh? Lehigh, Lay. I don't okay. know. Okay, okay. Uh, in the Patriot League Championship, Montana State beat Montana 85 to 70 to win the Big Sky Championship. And that is concludes all the teams that punch their ticket in there's lots of like second round quarterfinals mm-hmm. semifinals today yep. and tomorrow so um just keep an eye on that for your tournament and bracket stuff yeah i think i one thing that uc needs if 
like if they win tonight and, and don't win, once again, it's I think they're still going to be on the outside looking. I'm not a bracketologist, and I'm not going to claim to be a bracketologist. Um, but from from what I read, they, they have an outside shot if they win tonight. They've got a pretty good shot if they win their next two games. Um, but all that being said, they can't have many bid thieves. They can't have teams that uh, are taking away taking away spots in the tournament. So hope that uh, hope that it's chalk in those lower tournaments. You know what I'm saying? Yep. All right. What else? What other news we got? The Reds, they played a very entertaining game yesterday. They had a final score 19 to 11 against the Jet uh Giants, not Jets. Uh Reds had seven home runs in that game. Who hit them? Um you have the box score? I do have the box score pulled up in front of me. Sling it. Uh Alfred, I don't know the first name. Okay. Uh Christian name. Encarnacion Strand. Yes, all right. Yeah, Luke Maley. Okay. Stuart Fairchild. Okay. Stewie, I saw I saw Nick Kirby's post about Stewie, and then uh, Elliot was in the background looking upset that Stewart had a home run. Yeah, and then uh, Nick Martini, Mike Ford, and finally Tony Kemp, I believe, all hit home runs yesterday. Oh wow! wow. Three of those names, as the as the roster keeps dwindling down, uh, three of those names that hit home runs yesterday are are on the the spot. I think I saw Bryce Spalding tweet. How likely the last spot on the roster is going to go to Mike Ford, Nick Martini, um, Tony Kemp, or Josh Harrison. Um, So three of those guys hit home runs yesterday. I think out of those people, I wonder who is going to get it. I can't imagine a Tony Kemp getting that spot. I can't imagine a Josh Harrison getting that spot. But um, Mike Ford seems like the most upside there. But so be it. So be it. But entertaining game nonetheless. Uh, The boys were down there. They looked like they had a fun time. That one clip that you're talking about where Stuart Fairchild hit the home run, that Mm -hmm. was uh, very entertaining to see uh, Elliot's reaction from that. Moving on to the NFL, there was some signings yesterday, some notable ones. The Cowboys finally get into the the ring. They signed Eric Kendricks, a linebacker. Calvin Ridley signed with the Tennessee Titans. Jonah Williams signs a deal with Arizona for a two-year $30 million deal. That That was a good pass on our behalf. Yeah, fifteen for Jonah. Yeah, yeah, and he got uh, nineteen, almost twenty million guaranteed. So it's probably safe to say that that was a good, good right. deal on the right. Calvin Ridley that. was an interesting deal. Ninety-two million for Calvin Ridley, and he got fifty million guaranteed. Am I crazy for that? I think it's crazy. I think the receiver market's a little nuts. Um, it's wild that they passed on paying AJ Brown a couple years ago, however long that was. Right, and now they're having to pay a almost 30-year-old Calvin Ridley mm-hmm. that amount of money. Yeah. I, I I do like how the Titans as a, you know, as a Bengals fan, you see Callahan go down there to be a head coach. I do like how they're they're, you know, they're trying, right? They they're saying, "Listen, we're going to we're going to put our best foot forward to let you succeed, um, Brian Callahan." And uh, man, they've just made some interesting moves. They made some interesting because we talked about like if if the Bengals were going to make a trade with T Higgins, one rumor that kept floating around was, hey, makes a lot of sense, right? They need a wide receiver. The Titans do. Uh, their head coach is the former offensive coordinator here in Cincinnati. A lot of connections there, but now that they signed Calvin Ridley, it doesn't seem likely that T Higgins is going to be going to Tennessee. Yeah, I think that that is uh, that's a safe assumption. Very safe assumption. Joe Flacco signs a deal with the Indianapolis Colts. Uh, Bobby Wagner signs with the Commanders. Mike Williams, receiver for the Chargers, who was out all last year, gets cut. That saves them, I think, $20 million in cap space, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it also incurs a dead cap hit of, like, 20-something. So oh, wow. it, it, it's just tough to be a Chargers fan right now. Uh, the Jets They've got a lot of moves. They've got a lot of decisions. The Chargers do. Oh yeah, I mean they're going to have to trade some of those guys away too. On that the defensive side, right? Those those big names, Bosa, Mac, all these guys. Yeah, I mean they. I think they've already come out and said that they don't want to trade Mac, but they kind of have to if they want to get above the cap. So we'll see. Um, Jets they trade for right tackle Morgan Moses. Um, from Baltimore. I believe Morgan Moses actually played in New York uh, the year prior to that. So that was a guy that I was looking forward to, to to having on the Bengals roster a few years ago when he was in the free agent 
uh, market, but can we, can we talk about, so a couple weeks ago I did these power rankings. I keep alluding to them. Maybe I'll do them one more time if I host again, um, after the first week of free agency, but I, I had the Ravens at number one. They, they were the best team in football all year long. I'm a Lamar Jackson believer. Um, a lot of news will be talked about how the Ravens got Derrick Henry, but listen to the following pieces that have left Baltimore. Their linebacker, Patrick Queen. Their safety comes to Cincinnati, Geno Stone. A starting tackle, Morgan Moses. John Simpson, who was a guard. Gus Edwards. Who was their starting running back? Obviously, they replaced him. And then four other, like, fill-in depth pieces. But the Ravens aren't going to have the same-looking team that they had this past year. Not quite, no. But I would say the Ravens are notoriously very, very good at getting the depth that they need. Yeah. And I'm sure that they feel comfortable with the players that they've let go to be able to fill in those holes, especially in positions that don't matter. Now, the Morgan Moses thing is a little, a little weird, but – um, hey, I mean they they got a they got some trade value out of them, so might as well do that. On to the Bengals news. Okay. Nick Scott released, I believe, at this point. I think that's official. That it is. Nick Scott yep. is released. What a we I give Duke Tobin in the Bengals a lot of credit for all their moves, and I've I've seen some posts about Nick Scott that are a year old. Nick Scott was an absolute dud right it wasn't the move that the Bengals were trying to do they were trying to bring back Von Bell who we'll talk about Von Bell later but he didn't have a great year we're getting him on a on a, on a minimum veteran minimum contract so it all works out but this is where I get a little uh queasy I don't know the right word a little anxious when it comes to some of the signings that the Bengals are making because I've seen not one but multiple year old takes about when the Bengals signed um Nick Scott right? He, he was a big part of the Rams when they won the Super Bowl against the, the Bengals. And people were like, man, he's athletic. He's quick. He's going to give versatility to the Bengals. What, what they forgot, what they forgot to mention in their uh, write-up of Nick Scott was is he didn't know how to tackle, which I don't know if you guys have watched football recently. I don't know if you've played football in the past. I don't know if you just know anything about football, but tackling is a big part of being a defensive player, especially a safety. So, uh, yeah, Nick Stone, uh, good riddance. Wasn't, wasn't, wasn't the best Cincinnati Bengal, and I give them a lot of credit, but that wasn't a good one. That wasn't a good one. It all worked out, I think, in the safety room, but it, it wasn't a good one. Yeah, and because of that uh... – that little deal there where we ended up cutting him. I believe that gave us enough money to get the contract done with Sheldon Rankins over the hump. We signed a two-year, $26 million deal with him. He was in contract negotiations with the Texans for a two-year, $24 million deal, but we just bumped it up just a tiny bit, and that was able to convince him to come to Cincinnati. The defensive tackle market was already crazy this year, mm -hmm. so I don't think that the projections had it at uh, as high as he got it. I think they were they were looking at a ten year or not ten year, uh, ten million per for for a guy like Rankins. But mm -hmm. with the way the market was, you know, unfolding, this is probably in line with the rest of the the signings. It also probably means that uh, DJ Reader's probably gone. If they uh, want to be able to try to keep DJ, it would have to be a long-term deal to push that cap back because um, I believe this year we're giving Rankins 14 yeah. this year. Yep. Yep. So it, in terms of what we had left, I think we were somewhere around $33 million in cap space, maybe 34 35 And that $14 million hit means that we only have like 20 million left so i just don't expect them to not address right tackle or 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 you know like if they were to get reader they're probably not going to address right tackle like we hoped so this means probably reader's gone but i wouldn't say it's completely out of the question like there's yeah. a small chance still if we give him like a three-year deal that we can make it work somehow right and if in a few minutes we're gonna have uh uh paul fritchner on from madison square garden talk about the big east tournament but 
Um, I'll tease all this Bengals talk, right? Or we're, we're talking about Sheldon Rankins, where we haven't quite gotten to the safety signing, or I guess we did. We talked about Von Bell a little bit. But I'll say this as a tease. Every single move that the Bengals have made thus far, it's not to say that it's going to be a perfect one. I have loved every single move. The move to get Sheldon Rankins gives the Bengals something perhaps that they haven't had in this current era of the Bengals. And we'll talk about that later on in the show. But I, I, I love every – I think that you still got to get a nose guard, right? But here's what, here's, what's, here's what I love about this, and, and this is the final thing I'll say because I don't want to spoil too much because we're going to talk about it a lot in the second era. If you get a nose guard, you sign a good nose guard, that lets you go into the draft – only needing one spot. And I think they were going to draft that spot anyways. And that's what I've been preaching for the longest time. Sign free agents for the interior defensive linemen. And get a stopgap at right tackle. But draft early a tackle. And, and hopefully that's your guy of the future. I know that it's I, it's a good tackle draft. But it's a thin tackle draft if that makes sense. Like... Like, there's a, there, there's a lot of guys that are going to be good starters in this league, but you got to get them early. You're not going to be able to get them later in the draft. But if they're able to get a nose guard in free agency, that allows the Bengals to, to stick with the BPA. The stick where they can go into the draft only needing a tackle, maybe some other, like, ah, so, some more depth in certain places, another pass catcher. But really, all they would need is a tackle in the draft, which is an incredibly um, great spot to be in. Incredibly great spot to be in. But. Yeah. And plus, as well, before we move on from this, uh, the the defensive tackle conversation, there's still guys like Tier Tart out there that you can get for cheap. Like, they're, they, I said this in my tweet yesterday when the, no, the news broke about Sheldon Rankins. It feels like they're going to do a two for one deal situation, and at least in my, my mm -hmm. opinion. Unless they decide that they're going to spend the second round pick on Tavondre Sweat, there's really not a nose tackle out there I feel comfortable with in this draft. And even Tavondre Sweat is just probably not going to be the guy that I feel very secure in long term, uh, just because he's not an every down player, in my opinion. But we'll, we'll see. Um, I, I, I saw the, Haro come in here. Yep. He's been a member. He's been a nut cutter for nine months. Thank you for being a member. Guys, if you want to see all the extra uh, content that we put out there, a lot of live streams, a lot of uh, videos. There was an incredibly funny – it's a short video. Incredibly funny short video um, from the road trip. Uh, Trace just laying into Elliot and poor Elliot. I mean, it was it, – it's a pretty funny video. It's only 30 seconds long. But Haro asked the question, watch party for the Mighty Musketeers today. They play at noon. The answer, in short, is Yes. We are going to have a watch party, and here's the best part. It's going to be for everyone. We're going to open it up for free. And it's going to be uh, it's going to be on a separate stream, but we will redirect you after this show. It'll be for everyone. So we'll watch the first half together. I'll put a bet out there. We could all uh, we could all sweat out together. But it looks like that we've got uh, our main man on the horn. Is that is that true? It looks like he's coming not from the garden, not from the Mecca of basketball, but coming from the hotel room. It's... Paulie Fricano, Paulie Fritchner, how's it going, man? What's up, brother? It's going great. I assume I gotta. Well. I assume since you're still at the hotel, the game's at twelve. Hopefully, it's not too long of a commute to Madison Square Garden from from where you're staying. Uh so I haven't looked out my room yet because I checked in at like one o'clock last night, mm -hmm. one a.m. Uh, after the games. So I uh, I don't know what I'm looking at outside yet. But uh, no, Reed, I can walk right across the street and uh, MSG is right there. So if I'm on the right side of the building, you could probably see it. If not, yeah, it's great. If you were doing a t-shirt toss, could you throw one from your window to Madison Square Garden? Ooh, that's a, I don't know, but I think I could probably throw a Joseph Otto group ball. The t-shirts are tough. You know, everybody, I catch a lot of flack for the t-shirts. They expand, you know, the rubber band breaks, stuff happens. There's air resistance, all this stuff. Right. The Joseph Otto group balls, that's a whole lot. That That's a different story. All right. Yesterday's day, the Muskies took down the Butler Bulldogs 76-72 
Paul, as a, a you obviously are, are, are connected there, as a, you know, a lay Xavier fan, it felt kind of nice, and I don't know how close Butler was to being a tournament. I know their their kind of tournament hopes had, had kind of gone down the drain recently, but when it felt nice to have kind of a flip of what had been in years prior to where Butler needed help in the Big East tournament, and we took them down. It had to feel nice. Well, yeah, Reed, and when you're there with 50 seconds left, you're up by seven, and you're thinking to yourself, okay, this just happened two years ago where Xavier was up by six with 50 seconds left, and then Paul Scruggs fouls up two, thinking they're up three, and it's just a disaster scene coming down the stretch, and then Travis Steele gets fired. I mean, that was that was terrible, and that's exactly what happened two years ago. I mean, this was the third time in four years that Xavier and Butler had played on Wednesday at Madison Square Garden. It was the second time in three years, or the previous two times it had gone to overtime it looked like this one might be going to overtime eight ties 22 lead changes in this game it was back and forth you know at, at first it was like one of those things where it was eight ties 20 you know it was all these lead changes but it wasn't I didn't think the first half was that great I thought it was kind of choppy back and forth but the second half they just decided nobody was going to play defense there was going to be some pretty good <laughs> shot making you know, Xavier didn't make a three in the first half, but then the second half, the lid kind of came off the bass. I think they made seven in the second half. Quincy, Davion, Dez combined for 65 of the 76 points. Look, nobody here, we all know it's going to be, it, it is going to be a monumental task to even make this game close today against UConn. But, you know, if, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen because of the guard play and to get that kind of a performance yesterday, especially from two guys that hadn't played at Madison Square Garden before. When you get here and you get to this situation, it, it just the tournament is so different when you get to MSG because the lights, the 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 pageantry, everything about it, it's just different. And to have somebody that or two guys here that hadn't played in that and to play that well, it was good to see. It was encouraging. Yeah, you mentioned you know you get to Madison Square Garden, you're, you're playing tournament basketball, you can get kind of tight. And as you mentioned, Xavier did not shoot well in the first half. They, they did not make a single three, but they come out in the second half, and you're right. They made seven threes in the first nine minutes or something like that. They didn't yeah. stop shooting. You had to like the, the, the confidence to, you know, we're, we're still gamers. We're still going to go out there and play. You can get real tight yeah. in those situations, but they come out and, and shoot. Yeah, just keep firing because that's what you've done all year. That's what's gotten you to this point. You can't stop just because it's not falling in the first half. Just because you're not making shots, you can't stop shooting if that's what's going to get you to this point. And, yeah, I think you're right about Butler. I mean, whatever slim chance Butler had to make the NCAA tournament, if there even was a chance, it's done. I mean, Butler's season is over now. I, I don't think I, I don't know what they're in i'll be honest i haven't done a whole lot of nit i <laughs> i don't really know what's going on with the nit read i'll, I'll be completely honest Fair hand enough. up on that one i have i have no idea what's going on with butler and the nit uh but uh yeah it's just you know butler's season effectively is is over because of that and like you said it was nice to be on the other side of that yesterday mm -hmm. instead of what happened two of the last three years sure sure yeah you alluded to it earlier obviously you play the the tournament favorite, the national championship favorite, the, the reigning national champs in UConn today, last time Xavier played, didn't go so well. Is there a shot today, or is it just a, a matchup nightmare? Well, it, well, oh, hold on. It is a matchup just disaster today. <laughs> but, but, you know, like if there's anything you can take away from this game against UConn today, it was a five-point game at Centos. You know, like, I, I know Donovan Klingon didn't play in that game, so he's going to play today, but it, it is it is a matchup disaster for Xavier. When you talk about how they've struggled this year, they've struggled in the post. Donovan Klingon could eat you alive. You saw what happened. I don't think it'll be like what happened on that Sunday at UConn. I don't think that will happen because I think uh, – I, I just think that that game, UConn – they played maybe one of their best games of the season in that game where they're just shooting. They couldn't miss. You know, everything was going right for UConn and everything was going wrong for Xavier. I, I don't I don't expect that. But I do expect UConn to come out here because I, I think a lot of times what happens is you get into the tournament or into the conference tournaments and you know, the team I'm, I'm not, not I'm not gonna say that the teams don't care about winning, but these teams like UConn or Houston or or Purdue 
that have a one seed locked up. And it's kind of it's kind of weird this year where mm-hmm. UConn, Houston, and Purdue, you know, not only if, for people that don't really know or, or follow the bracketology too close, if you're a one seed, you get to pick what region you go to, right? So if you're a UConn, you get your choice. Are you going to go to the East region? Are you going to play in Boston? Are you going to go to the Midwest, the South, the West, whatever? And it goes by pecking order. So the, the number one overall seed gets the first pick, then, the, you know, from there. Well, you – Usually it would be, well, at this time of the year, are you are you trying to jump and maybe leapfrog a little bit to get that higher number one seed? This year it doesn't matter because UConn's going to go to the east, Purdue's going to go to the Midwest, Houston's going to go to the south, and then maybe Arizona, whoever it is, is going to go out west. But it doesn't matter because that fourth one's just going to slot in mm-hmm. out in the west. Could be North Carolina, could be Tennessee. So it's it's very weird this year that it's just – it feels like from the number one seed perspective, there's really nothing to play for. And uh, if you're a UConn, what you're trying to do here is you're trying to check every single box. You're trying to be the number one overall seed. You're trying to be the Big East tournament champion. You're trying to be the re- Big East regular season champion, Big East you know, all, coach of the year, every single box that you're trying to go down and check that didn't get player of the year. But, uh, you know, it's March, Reed. And back in 2004, March. Xavier... Xavier went to Dayton and they played an undefeated St. Joe's team that was the best team in the country at the time and they beat them by what 20. So you never know, Reed. You never know. You, you never, never know. know. 20 year anniversary of that and the, the Muskies are going to get it done today. How big's the the store's contingent going to be at Madison Square today? How loud are they going to be? You know, <sighs> It is it is a special experience to and and I know if if you're a Xavier fan listening to this you don't want to hear it but if you haven't been to Madison Square Garden it when you watch UConn play in the Garden this afternoon session of of basketball at MSG mm-hmm. between UConn and then Seton Hall and St John's playing each other this noon afternoon session is going to be incredible just because all the fan base is being there at the same time UConn if there's 18,000 people there I mean UConn will have half at least it's just it's just how they are they call it stores south it's like a home game for UConn yeah no doubt about it. um yeah it wasn't the only Big East game that happened yesterday I, I sent you a text yesterday I said hey you mind coming on the show mind giving me 15 minutes and he said yeah absolutely Reed um and then I said Blue Demons on top soon. So close. DePaul. DePaul. They almost got it done, Paulie. They almost got it done. They almost got it done. And I mean, to be honest, probably the best case scenario for the Big East tournament that the last game of the day was actually exciting and DePaul gave them all they could handle but then didn't actually win because Villanova Marquette tonight will be a much better game than Marquette DePaul would have been. Mm -hmm. But I, that's just it's just terrible for the and you know to be fair to DePaul they had won a Big East tournament game three of the last four years coming into this so they get here one of those games was against Xavier last year they beat Seton Hall in a thriller I mean they they have won games in the Big East tournament that even where they haven't had success in the NC or in the regular season they they've won games just I mean I don't know even know what that defense was on that last play I mean just give Justin Moore an open three like it, it kind of a microcosm of the season but yeah to be up by that much. And then to not be able to close it out, Villanova's got a ton of issues this year. They spent a ton of money on that roster, and to to almost lose to DePaul to end your—I mean, that would have ended their season. Villanova's fighting for the NCAA tournament life. Yikes! All we'll right, see. Because I I think I think Villanova could pretty. I, I feel pretty confident that they could beat Marquette tonight without Tyler Kolick. It's one of the, it's mm-hmm. kind of like what happened with UC, where you struggle in the first game against one of the worst teams in the conference. Mm-hmm. And then you come out and you have a much better performance the next night against a team that, you know, the line will be a whole lot closer. That's kind of what I expect out of Villanova tonight. We'll see. Yeah, we will see. All right, so you, you brought him up. You know, you're not only the host of the Sean Miller podcast, one of the hosts of the Sean Miller podcast, you also host the Rebound Rundown. So let's go across country to, to UC. They've obviously have won two Big 12 games. What's the likelihood? If they win tonight, are they still on the outside looking in? Do they got to win two games? Like what does what, what UC got to do? It, UC has to win the Big 12 tournament. Yeah, now, really? th- if they they do, if they beat Baylor and they beat, let's say Iowa State tomorrow night, that'll put them at least in the conversation that if, if a lot of things happen over the next two days, maybe you could be sitting there on Selection Sunday and say, okay, well, maybe. But the problem is for Cincinnati, 
they didn't do enough in the non-conference because you only gave yourself two opportunities and you lost both of them. And the committee is going to see that Kansas was without Hunter Dickinson and Kevin McCuller. They'll take that into account. Beating West Virginia doesn't count for anything. Beating Kansas without Hunter Dickinson and Kevin McCuller isn't exactly it, – it, it's, it's a good win, but it's not enough to get you into the tournament. Beating Baylor would turn some heads, and beating Iowa State certainly would. But the, I, I, on my segment on the rebound rundown previewing the Big 12 tournament, I, I spent a long time talking about UC and talking about this opportunity that they had in front of them because you could see the writing on the wall that if you could get by West Virginia, which they barely they did, did, but they right. got by West Virginia – the door is wide open to beat Kansas and they do it. Not only did they beat Kansas, but they did it convincingly. And when Kansas got it close, UC responded, which was the big thing. I was sitting there last night. I had the game on while the, while the DePaul game was going on. And you're sitting there and you're thinking to yourself, okay, here comes Kansas. You know, they're going to make a run. Can they, you know, can they respond? They did. So now if you're, if you're Baylor, right? Baylor's not played yet. They're sitting there. So you see two games in two days. It is so hard to win five games in five days. We've seen teams do it before. UConn back in 2011 won five games in five days with Kevin Walker and then went on to win the national championship. You know, it's, it's possible. It's extremely rare, but it's possible. But if you look at bracketology right now, if you go to Bracket Matrix, which is the best website to do bracketology, it takes every bracketologist in the country and puts it in one place. UC does not appear in one single bracket right now on Bracket Matrix. And that's really, really hard to overcome in just two days to make your entire resume at the very end of the season. That's really hard. The committee talks a lot about the full body of work and what you did over the course of the entire season, you know. You see that that's the first time you see one consecutive games in the Big 12 in these last two days all season. So I, I just I think beating Baylor and beating Iowa State would put you at least in the conversation like they, they would probably appear on a few brackets. But I just don't think that it would be enough to get over it. Now, obviously, you win the Big 12 tournament. You're in. So maybe you hope that like a Houston gets upset. And, and, it, and that kind of goes back to what I was saying a few minutes ago, Reed, where Maybe Houston kind of just coasts through it, and right, right. you know, and and maybe you see. So, it, it, I to me, this game tonight, this game tonight is the turning point for UC because Baylor hasn't played yet. Two games in two days, you kind of start to get the fatigue factor can can kind of start to play. You remember last year, Xavier played those two games and then got completely worn down against Marquette on day three in the title game. But yeah, that's a long-winded way to answer your question, Reed. I, I I firmly believe UC is going to have to win the Big Twelve tournament to get in. All right, but if they get to the tournament or the championship, they're at least on the radar. They're, they're at least on the. It would be really. It at least makes for a. It at least makes for a fun selection Sunday for Cincinnati fans. I think. It's it'd be yeah. interesting to see if if Houston you know continues to to do what they're doing and they make it to one side of the bracket and then UC makes it in. And we're talking about the Big 12. And it doesn't say anything necessarily about the Big 12. But it would be interesting to see in the first year of these new teams in the Big 12, they have two former American Conference teams in the best conference in yes. college basketball making the championship. Once again, it doesn't say anything. It just be would, would be interesting to see that happen. But that's, uh, that's neither here nor there. All right, what's, uh, you, you spent a lot of time in, uh, in your young professional life in New York. What's your spot of choice there? Are you are you like Michael Scott and get the Sabaro pizza? Like so your spot of this choice? this week all the this week always wears me out because I'm in I'm in MSG for so long that it's really hard to get out and get some food. There is a McDonald's that's right across the street that I uh, I will be running to I think right after this. There there are some good spots. There are some good pizza spots that I want to try that I haven't gotten to try. Like John's a bleaker. I haven't been able to got mm -hmm. to get down there yet. Um, but I don't. I really, you know, like for a, a nicer dinner, Carmine's is great. But I didn't usually. I'd go there on Tuesday. I didn't fly in until yesterday morning. So I think this week is is a lot more uh, a lot more business this week. I don't think I'm going to be enough. able to get out as much. But but yeah, it's uh, there's some spots. I just I need to get out a little more and, and kind of expand the horizons. Yeah, Carmine's those it never fails. That Italian chicken parm. I know, I know, I know. You like your Italian food. I, I didn't take oh, yeah. you for an Italian burger place. McDonald's sounds like a fancy place. I know they. I know. Oh yeah, no doubt. Yeah, absolutely. Paul, I know you got to get to Madison Square Garden. Thank you for for hopping on. 
Um, as always, uh, good luck to the Muskies as they play in about an hour and 15 minutes as they try to shock the world. Take on the store's contingent, the, the team that is... You never know, it. Reed. You never know. Hey, what do they say? It's March. It's March. It is. All right. Good yes. luck, Paulie. Thank you for hopping on. See you, brother. See ya. See ya. See ya. Paul, always a delight. Always a delight to hear from Paul. Um, he, he, he brought some things because I think the, 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 the UC conversation that we had was... Inter Once again, not a bracketologist. Don't claim to be. I never will claim to be. But... Paul comes in and he says, you know, we're, we're talking about, does UC need to win a game? Does UC need to win two games? And it, it turns out that they, Paul thinks they got to win three. They got to they gotta win the championship. They got to take the Big 12 championship. Um, I think a lot of people would disagree with that, but Paul knows way more than I know, so I'll, I'll take his opinion on that. I know you guys always give me, uh, you always say, I, I always catch flack from you guys for deferring to uh, not, Expert, but people that are way more knowledgeable than I am. Uh, I feel like that's a pretty safe way to live life, but I catch. K Casey, you think the Muskies can get it done against UConn? 15 point underdogs. They lost by about a billion last time they played. Reed, respectfully, I don't think there's a single chance. Not even, not even a 0, 0, 0. 0. 0. 0. 1 percent chance. There's a 0% chance. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. They're just the best. They're just the best team right now. They're just the best. Casey, I hated that answer. <laughs> I hated that answer with every fiber of my being. I didn't like that at all. But uh, Xavier plays at noon today, 15-point underdogs against the UConn Huskies. And then you got a long, about a seven-hour gap. Got about a seven-hour gap, and then the Bearcats will take on the Baylor Bears. They're five-and-a-half, six-and-a-half-point underdogs out there in Kansas City. Maybe they get it done again. Who knows? The thing about UC, unlike Xavier, is that they haven't been blown out a whole lot, right? They're in every game, much to the chagrin of the cardiologist uh, of UC fans because, man, this Bearcats team's taking years off life. So uh, good luck to, to both teams tonight. Casey, let's go into our ad reads, and then we'll come out of here, and we will talk Sheldon Rankins and Von Bell. Okay. The Bengals report that we're about to do is brought to you by – Encore Technologies. Encore Technologies provides IT solutions for a data-centered world with a suite of services from mobile computing to desktop to data center, supporting both centralized and work-from-home computing modules to improve efficiency and productivity. That's right. Visit Encore.tech. The path to innovation begins here. And let me tell you about this lovely bottle of water right here. Pawnee Water. Made right here in Hamilton, Ohio, uses natural limestone filtration, unlike the artificial processing that other brands use. The result is a healthy alkaline water, and some say the best tasting water in the world. Visit Pawnee Water at P-A-H-H-N-I-Water.com to see where you can buy this great tasting water. And let me tell you about our newest sponsor, Game Time. Mm. The Game Time app came in clutch for me all last year. Anytime I wanted to go to a Reds game, I was going straight to the Game Time app because let me tell you, they show you where your seats are. They always have the best prices, especially when you're trying to get them last minute. And uh, all the pricing's up front, so you don't have to like do all this nonsense where you go to one book or book, you go to one app and it, it, they add all this other uh, charges and stuff. All of it's right there for you to see. So you can get the best seats and the best prices guaranteed. Um, Go ahead and download the Game Time app. Redeem code OTB for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. That's redeem code OTB for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Um, guaranteed best prices and uh, best seats. So check right. them out. All right, check them out. That's right. Thank you to Game Time. Thank you to Tapani. Thank you to Encore. Thank you to United Dairy Farmers for. Uh, sponsoring this show, letting me and Casey have a job, pay the bills, um, and, and doing all that fun stuff. All right, Casey, we alluded to it. So we talked about it in the rundown, and we've talked a lot about the Cincinnati Beckers for the past few weeks. I said two, two, week, two days ago, I said, this is a forward-thinking franchise. I said that because of the running back move, of trading away Joe Mixon, doing right by Joe Mixon, by the way, and bringing in Zach Moss, a younger, more explosive uh, and cheaper option than Joe Mixon. They go get Geno Stone. They mo go get Mike Gusecki, who's a ma matchup nightmare. And I don't recall being this excited for an offseason. 
and it hasn't come from any huge moves, right? They've all been relatively small. They, they, didn't, they didn't go out and get Orlando Brown like they did last year, but every single move that the Bengals have made so far is calculated, makes the team better, and fills a hole. And if the Bengals keep going down this trajectory of, of, of what they're doing, there's still two glaring weaknesses on this team that we all know. We all know, and I've talked about them at length. Casey is, is very concerned about the nose guard. I'm not so concerned about tackle. I, once again, am concerned as with the nose guard. Sheldon Rankin signs yesterday. Two years, $26 million. I mean, we, we talked about DJ Reader. We talked about Eric Armstead. We get Sheldon Rankins. And, and Casey pointed out some tweet to me that we were in a bidding war for him. Well, we won the bidding war. And the thing that excites me most about Sheldon Rankins, I've brought this point up now since I started hosting the show. The last five Super Bowl winners all have had a dominant force rushing the passer. Right? Aaron Donald for the Los Angeles Rams. Vita Vea for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And then Chris Jones in the three Super Bowls that the Chiefs have won. And as a Bengals fan, I wanted that. What happened the last time the Cincinnati Bengals had a pass rusher coming from the interior? Larry Ogunjobi? Bengals made the Super Bowl. Sheldon Rankins, and I say this with all love and respect to Larry Ogunjobi, Sheldon Rankins... Is better. Sheldon Rankins has played one more year than Larry Ogunjobi, but he averages almost more sacks than Ogunjobi's had throughout his entire career. Uh, Ogunjobi's best year was with the Bengals in 2021. He had seven sacks. Other than that, he's had a couple years of five and a half. Hasn't done a whole lot the last two years. Rankins, who's a year older, is coming off a season where he had six sacks. He had eight just a little while ago when he was a young buck in New Orleans. This is something that the Bengals have had before, once again, back in 2021, but not to this level. Sheldon Rankins per, promotes a threat unforeseen before in this current angle or current era of the Cincinnati Bengals. Now, they're, once again, the work's not finished, job's not finished, whatever the Kobe Bryant quote is. But Sheldon Rankins, once again, puts fear in the AFC North quarterbacks, puts fear in Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes. We talked all year long about the Bengals need more pass rush. Well, we have a guy that's second in the league in sacks. How are we going to get it? How do we improve on that? Well, it's edge rusher. Now it's interior. Be be between Trey Hendrickson, between Sheldon Rankins, between Miles Murphy, and the entire roster on that defensive front, this Cincinnati Bengals team has its best pass rushing threat in recent memory. These guys are going to get after the quarterback. And we know how crucial that is. I mean, the, the AFC is stacked with quarterback. The, the, there's a reason that the highest paid guys in the league directly interact with the quarterback. We're talking the e quarterback, the tackle, the wide receivers, and edge rushers. Highest paid guys in the league. There's a reason for that. And you're going to find out why. In a, in, in a conference that the Bengals are trying to win again, right? They, they, they won the... AFC back in 2021. They go to the AFC Championship back in 22. In a conference where they're trying to win, trying to compete with a team that has built a dynasty in the Kansas City Chiefs, where they're trying to compete with the Josh Allen Buffalo Bills who can't seem to get over that hump but are right there, and you know they're going to be right there every year. When they're trying to compete with a guy as quick and as crafty and as shifty as Lamar Jackson. When they're trying to compete with, with the Justin Herberts out there in L.A. We don't know what's going to happen with them when they're trying to win the AFC. It is so important to make a quarterback feel uncomfortable. And with Trey Hendrickson, 
with Sheldon Rankins and a guy that I'm not selling my stock on, and you shouldn't either. In fact, when, when people tell you that Miles Murphy is a bust, say, give me a year and come back and, and, and put a pin in that take. This Bengals defensive front is more vicious than it's been. Once again, need to get a nose tackle. Need to get someone to clog up the holes on the run game. We can't be getting gashed like we did last year. Is it going to be the over-the-hill guy that's been here for a while and DJ Reader that's coming off of a pretty nasty injury? Is that what we're going to do? I don't know. But there's a few options that the Bengals have in front of them. And if the excitement of getting pass rush, if, if, if that doesn't excite you as a Bengals fan, let me put this in your ear. If they do get a nose tackle, if they get a viable right tackle, not a great, but a viable right tackle, I still think that they're going to draft one early. Then the Bengals can go into the draft with perhaps one of the best luxuries in the sport. They go into the draft just, hey, we'll take the best guy. Nah, we don't need to fill any holes. We got them all covered. We just want the best guy. That's, that's what excites me. We're pushing the center of the line back, and we have now the potential, if we get a nose guard, that's the big if. That's the big if. If we get a nose guard, we have the opportunity to go into the draft and say, listen, we're just going to keep trying to get the best athletes. We're going to keep trying to get the best football players. We're going to keep filling this roster with talented people and not worry about what needs to be filled. Because you know what? We've done it in free agency. We've got veterans there. We got guys that we trust. That's what excites me. Casey, when you think about the Sheldon Rankins deal, just give me your overall opinions. So the Sheldon Rankins deal, um, I think is a I think it's a a good move. I just hope that this doesn't mean that Reader is completely out. I want there to be some chance that we can still get him. I still think there's other options besides Reader, but what made that 2021 team so good, right? I was just looking at the numbers today. B.J. Hill and Larry Ogunjobi both had eight sacks. They both had 40 pressures together. So that that alone, if you were to put that one position, the, the three-tech mm -hmm. spot, Mm -hmm. That one position alone had over 80 pressures and 16 sacks. The win rate was, if you combine both of them, around that 9% area. That's pretty damn good. You look at what, what Sheldon Rankins did this year. He had 40 pressures, 6 sacks, and he had a win percentage of 14.6, which is also very, very good. Very, very good for a 3-tech. It was 11th in the league this year, right right behind guys like Justin Matabike. Um, not the same amount of pressures, but similar win percentages, which mm -hmm. is good, right? Mm -hmm. um, my issue, though, is DJ Reader is part of the reason why they are able to have that sort of production. They were the reason why – they were able to have one-on-ones with guys on the inside because DJ Reader was plugging up a lot of the holes. You look at, like, 2022 Bengals, and DJ Reader, I mean, he did a lot of uh, a lot of good stuff in terms of pressure. Like, he filled in that, that extra pass-rushing role. I mean, it, it wasn't completely filled. There was a void there, but there was a, an effort made by him to be a better pass rusher, and he ended up having um, a really good season last year despite only playing 13 games. Um, there was a point in the season where he was, I believe, leading leading the league, at least in the defensive mm -hmm. interior position in terms of win percentage, pressures, and things of that nature before he got hurt. This year, I mean, he had a 12.9 win percent, which is really good, and I – I worry about the tread on the tires for B.J. Hill as well. He's getting older. I think that he was very lucky. Not lucky. Lucky is not the right word. But he was very um, fortunate to have a guy beside him like D.J. Reader to be able to get those one-on-ones, like I said. Mm -hmm. I think it's important that we still get a guy. 
that we still go out and get get a guy. And many people point to Tier Tart. And Tier Tart did not have a good season last year. But if you look at the most recent season where he actually played, um, where he a- had significant snaps, um, he was very, very good. 11.1% win rate. Uh, only had 26 pressures, but he was a nose tackle, right? Mm-hmm. He was mm-hmm. what DJ Reader right. is. Um, not as good as a run stopper. But, again, you're in a pass-happy league. You don't necessarily need to have the best nose tackle to win football games. You just need good pressure, right? And if you have that rotation of Rankins, B.J. Hill, and you try to fill in with Tier Tart, I think you have something there. I think you're you're in a good spot. You really need Miles Murphy to show up. You need Sam Hubbard to stay healthy. And I think – and Trey Hendrickson, of course, too. I think you have enough there to – to say that you've improved on the defensive line. I, that, that's undeniable. Even in losing DJ Reader, if, if you get you know a viable, Tier Tart's the name that gets thrown around. It, it, if you get a nose tackle that, that isn't a project, right? That isn't a draft pick. That, 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 that's a known commodity. I think it's undeniable that the Bengals have their best defensive front in this you know three, four year spurt since the Bengals made the Super Bowl. The only thing that comes close is, what, 2021 with, with Owen Joby and, and Reeder and, and Sam Hubbard and, and, and their line. Miles Murphy, I think we saw enough at, at the end, but they have the opportunity to really get after some dudes. They have the opportunity to put some fear. I, I am cautious as I pump up, you know, I, I take my megaphone and, and, and say, Duke Tobin's doing a great job. The Cincinnati Bengals are are back baby super bowl bound go buy your ticket today you'll cash it next february as i do all of that i am cautious that we are getting in a trend and maybe it's not a bad trend right and that trend is when we signed geno stone what was the news on on geno stone well zach taylor Really liked the way that he played. Geno Stone played against the Bengals. Had an incredible play that prevented the Bengals winning week two. Had that interception in the red zone. You might remember it. Great play. Okay, that's fine. Like, you you see a guy and he impressed you and then you go and get him. Then you go look at Sheldon Rankin's game log this season. He had six sacks. You know when he got half of them? It was against the Cincinnati Bengals. He was a wrecking ball. You might remember it. So the trend is that these guys are leaving lasting impressions on the front office. The trend is that these guys play maybe their best game against the Cincinnati Bengals, and the Bengals go out and say, hey, I remember how well these guys played. Let's go get them. And that doesn't have to be dangerous. But it is a coincidence, to say the least. Sheldon Rankin's and Geno Stone had their best plays of the season, their best games, come against the Cincinnati Bengals, and they, they end up here. It doesn't worry me. But if both don't pan out and we do the same thing next year, then it becomes a worry, right? And, I, and, and I'm not going to deep two, because this is a thought that just came in the last five minutes as I'm looking through the game logs of Sheldon Rankins, and, I'm, and, I, and I remember the, the game log of Geno Stone. That I want to keep going down that road, right? I don't want to just get a guy because they, they owned us. Might mean nothing. Might mean something. But as I've said, this move for Sheldon Rankins, if they're able to get a nose tackle, it's so important because we got gash on the line. But also, we, 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 we've improved in the safety position. We'll get to that. You got to think that the linebackers aren't going to take a step back, but you still need to have the nose tackle that can that can clog up some holes. Casey, here is the one thing I see a lot of people continuing to say, "Reader, reader, we need to go get reader." There is, like I said before, a very small percent chance, like a five to ten percent chance that you get them, and here's why. I'm a little scared they, about it. Like they, it's they already have 13 14 million this year with Rankins 10 million 
and B.J. Hill. What, 17 with Hendrickson? 10 with Hubbard? It's a lot of money. A lot of money tied up on D-line. And we only have, like, what, 25, 20 million left in cap? We still need a right tackle. Still need depth at corner. I just don't see how they can get it done with Reader unless it was a long-term extension. And I just don't think they're going to give a guy that's 30 years old a three-, four-year deal. And I think it's worth it, right? I think it's worth giving Reader a three- or Mm four-year deal and pushing that money out because the first two years you're getting Reader are still going to be Reader, in my opinion. Barring the injury, if he can recover from that, and that's I think a big, that's, that's a big that's a big caveat case. Yeah, and that that's the only reason I think that this isn't happening is because if they don't give him a long term deal, and they do give him a short term deal, right? You're probably having to cut BJ Hill to save seven million dollars, and then you're back to square one where you don't you have a you need depth there again. So it's just it doesn't make sense to do that. It makes more sense to go out and get a guy like Tier Tart. Who I'm looking right now, I mean, he's no DJ Reader by any stretch of the imagination. But DJ Reader really wasn't DJ Reader until his last year in Houston. And we didn't really get to see T.R. Tart in his last year in Tennessee because he wanted a deal and he basically just kind of sat out and had, I guess, mm-hmm. character flaws is what has been thrown around. But I don't know if it's necessarily that or he just didn't want uh, to play, give his all if they wasn't going to give him a, a, a long-term extension in Tennessee, which – understandable i think that you make that move and you're getting closer to what 2021 was right yes you're losing probably something there in the run game but at the same time like you also need your linebackers to play better anyways like that was another big problem last year was just our linebacker play (laughs) safety play (laughs) and now we got von bell back which is a huge boost in that department I think he's going to get those guys right. He's going to get them in position to make yeah. those plays. And then I, I think that helps the linebackers out too because they're not having to drop back so much. So I think the smart move, the smart move is to get tier tart before anyone else does for a cheaper deal than DJ Reader. The best move, though, is to find a way to convince Reader to do – either less money well, or, the, or, or the Bengals break that. down and give him a longer-term right. extension. Well, that's, he that's the point. Here, here, here's the thing, and, and I'll push uh, – not push back, but I'll give you the reasons as to why the Cincinnati Bengals won't sign DJ Reader. It still might happen, right? Connection there. Bengals have shown um, time before to to give credence to a, to a connection. But let's take into account what the Cincinnati Bengals have shown us when they're signing guys. They don't like signing 30-year-old free agents. Well, Sheldon Rankins is going to be 30 years old, and DJ Reader's over 30 years old. But they don't like signing 30-year-old free agents. DJ Reader, 30 years old. They don't like signing guys off an injury. Well, check again. And to be honest, to be honest, guys, how, if we don't like having 30-year-old free agents, if we don't like having 30-year-old players, are we going to put two on the defensive line? They still have, they still have football to give, right? It's they, more, than, more than two. It's three, right? B.J. Hill's right there. Oh, uh, yeah. It, it just it, it checks a couple of boxes that the Bengals have shown in the past to not want to do. And that is don't sign 30-year-olds. Don't sign guys off injuries. So – I don't want to I don't want to be the guy that because everyone killed me yesterday for the Justin Jefferson take and I get it but I don't want to be the guy that goes like hey maybe we shouldn't get DJ Reader I'm just telling you that it doesn't seem likely based off money based off age based off injury and based on the fact that we've already gotten multiple guys on that line that's getting old right we're, we're gearing up for the future at the same time of trying to be viable now Here's the here's the small little bit of hope, the scenario that makes sense to me that we can bring DJ back. And it has to do with some exterior forces in play as well. Eric Armstead being out there is massive. And he's going to command more money than DJ Reader. 
the Lions have the capability of paying Eric Armstead. And if they fall in love with Eric Armstead instead of DJ Reader because of the injury, because of his history of usually getting hurt for a couple games in the season, there's a chance we can still bring DJ Reader back. The longer this actually draws out now, in my opinion, without Tier Tart mm-hmm. um, being signed, the better it is for the Bengals because that means that the Lions are sitting there debating – Armstead, Reader, Tart, whatever. Right. That's the other thing, too, is Lions get T.R. Tart. I mean, where's D.J. Reader going to go? The Texans can't pay him what they – like. they're not going to be able to pay him. They have like $15 million in cap space left or something like that. So, for me, we can outbid the Texans mm-hmm. in that department. So, those are the, the, the small bits of chances and hope that you still kind of hold on to that maybe there's a chance they fall in love with Eric Armstead. There was – Rumors out there, I don't know how true they are, that the Lions, Bengals, Texans were all interested, and the Bills somehow, interested in Eric Armstead. Um, that's the hope, right? Lions fall in love with Eric Armstead instead of Reader, which is a very big possibility. Mm-hmm. I think that's bigger than, than many people realize. But, again, it's just the, the character profile for Reader that I just don't know if the Bengals will pull the trigger on. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of no's. The one yes is that he he's been here. He's been here. He's been great. He's been, as Casey has put, probably our our, our most efficient, most dominant force on the defensive side. Doesn't doesn't get the acclaim that a Trey Hendrickson does, right? Because he doesn't do what Trey Hendrickson does, which is get to the quarterback. He he doesn't get the acclaim that I think a guy like Cam Taylor Britt will get in the future because he doesn't do what Cam Taylor Britt does. But it's incredibly important. The, this is this is where when you get inside football that these these guys that you know their job is to to analyze moves guys that their 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 job is to 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 break down roster construction. This is the the guys that they like. They like those hole fillers. They they, they like when other teams struggle to run the ball, and and we know it. That's why the, that's why the team defense wasn't great last year. We didn't talk about the secondary. It's young. I have a lot of faith in the secondary. I've mentioned that before. But if you can't stop the run, that's, stop, that, that, that's, that's the most important thing. Bengals were in the bottom third, bottom fifth, whatever. They were like 30th out of 32 teams in run stopping last year. That was with DJ Reader. We will see what happens with the Bengals. But if they get a nose guard like Tier Tart, if they get a nose guard like DJ Reader, if they get a nose guard to where we're not going into not going into the draft needing to get an interior lineman, I will have the most faith in the defensive front than I've had this entire run. Same. I think that if you get a guy like Tier Tart, this defensive front is better than they were in 2021, which is when they were at their best. This defensive line is better than 2022. This defensive line can cook. This defensive line can stop the run. They can get after the quarterback. And I've talked about how important that is. Push back the center of the pocket. That's the next edge in football. That's what all the teams are trying to get. That's why Chris Jones got $150 million. That's why Aaron Donald could will a Rams team, a good Rams team, but could will a Rams team over the Bengals in the Super Bowl. This is huge, guys. Sheldon Rankins paired with Trey Hendrickson, paired with a Miles Murphy. All of a sudden, we're pushing guys down on the turf a lot. All of a sudden, Lamar Jackson ain't going to be scrambling around. All of a sudden, Patrick Mahomes is a little worried. All of a sudden, a guy like Josh Allen feels a little uneasy. Russell Wilson, Deshaun Watson, if you're worried about those guys, good luck. They haven't looked great over the past few years. haven't looked mobile. They're going to need to be. They're going to need to be because this Bengals defensive front is coming for them. That's the caveat. The caveat is, is that they get a nose tackle. Also helped the defense yesterday, Von Bell signed. I did not see this one coming. 
Truly did not see this one come. I'm scrolling through Twitter. Everyone likes to put out the cryptic treats, tweets. What are we with the Zodiac? Like, what's with the, just, just say what you mean. And everyone's just putting the bell emoji. And I'm like, what did David Bell do? What did David Bell, why, why are these, why are there all these Bengals accounts tweeting about David Bell? And I was like, oh, Von Bell did not see another move for safety. But you get a veteran minimum. Now, Von Bell wasn't good last year. Very bad, actually. So bad so that the Panthers are cutting him and paying most of his salary. What's the old David Justice money ball scene with Billy Bean? Yankees are paying half of your contract to play against him. That's what they think about you. But we get a voice, right? In a, in a secondary that is so young. Before getting Geno Stone, and Geno Stone's young. He's 24 years old. Before getting Geno Stone, we're looking at a secondary that is Cam Taylor Britt, who hasn't been in the league very long. Jordan Battle, DJ Turner, Dax Hill, all these guys have been in the league for, what, two years? Von Bell, former captain of the Cincinnati Bengals, is back here in Cincinnati. A comfortable voice that understands Lou Anarumo in the defensive corner, understands what the Bengals are trying to accomplish on that side of the ball. I don't know how much Von Bell is going to actually attribute on field. Right? It's a depth piece. It lets guys move around. I saw people in our Discord talking about it lets Dax Hill play a different role. He's athletic enough to play a different role. But Von Bell brings veteran leadership and a young secondary. Brings, hey, I was on this team when we were bad, and I helped us get good. I, If you ask Bengals fans across the board, what is the moment? What is the moment that led to this current ang- era of the Cincinnati Bengals? A lot will point out the day that we drafted Joe Burrow. Fair. I'm not going to argue there. But for me, for me, you remember that Monday night football game? It's COVID. We had a... I think at that time we had a curfew because of COVID. Bars had to close down at 10. The Pittsburgh Steelers, 11 and 1, 11 and 0. Big Ben coming in. One last ride. The nightmares fuel up. How many times has Big Ben beaten the Bengals? And we're the worst team in the league. They're 11 and 1. Oh, man. National television. We're going to get embarrassed on national television. And what does Von Bell do? He breaks up that attack, gets the fumble. And from there, the Bengals have good. From there, the Bengals have been what we think they are today. That's my start of this area of the Cincinnati Bengals. That hit from Von Bell. And now he's back in the room. Casey, what excites you most about getting the veteran leadership of Von Bell back? Well, the the fact that they got him for so cheap, right, the – that was such a smart move. It's exactly what the Steelers did with Russell Wilson, right, where they don't have to pay him a whole lot of money because the other team is already doing that. Yeah, it's a smart move. Bring him back. He was already mm-hmm. a great leader on this team. Rejuvenized the defense after that hit. I I agree with that point. Um, and hopefully he still knows most of the scheme, right? I mean, he was here for three years, four years. So, I mean, I – I'm very excited because I don't think people realize he's not going to be starting, right? He's going to be probably your um, Uncle Mike. I don't know if you guys remember that that quote from Mike Thomas. Yeah. Uh, he was referenced as Uncle Mike because he was the old guy in the, the mm-hmm. secondaries room or the receiver room. Yeah, that's Uncle Bell now. That's Vaughn Bell. He's going to get those guys right, make sure that they know what they're doing. Um and it's great depth. If Battle gets hurt, if any of those guys get hurt, really, I'm very comfortable now in the secondary to say, yep, Bell will get it done. Bell will take care of things, and we'll be moving on forward as is. The other thing, too, is um, it could be a sign that this is how they feel about uh, Dax Hill. And Dax Hill's a great slot guy. Um, at least out of college he was, and he's great inside the box. He's great at blocking, uh, blocking, defending tight ends. Mm-hmm. So that maybe means that he's going to be expected more inside the box, you know, be able to do what he's best at, sideline to sideline running. Um, 
which is great. I think uh, the guy that was really good at doing that for us was Von Bell in a way. Mm -hmm. And you learn from a leadership, a a leader like him. And uh, I think you'll, you'll be set. So for me, I think it's a smart move. I don't think it takes away much, much of the, the snaps away from the other guys. It's a depth piece, a leadership role. Great move. Great move for the money. Yeah, I think when I first heard it, I was a bit upset. I think I text Casey. I was like, what? What are we doing? Von Bell? We just got Geno Stone. We have Dax Hill and, and Jordan Bell. Why are we getting Von Bell? And then, then it comes out. He's going to play for a million dollars. You can't You can't say no to that. You already needed some some veteran leadership in the secondary, so why not get the guy that's been around for a while? And there was going into this postseason, I I talked about this defense, and I said there's going to be a lot of shrugging and hoping. You're going to shrug and hope that Logan Wilson and Jermaine Pratt get a little better, go back to the form that they were the years previous and and not what they were in 2023. You're going to shrug and and hope that Miles Murphy turns out to be the the guy that was thought to be a top 10 pick and not the guy that didn't play a whole lot of snaps his rookie year. You're going to shrug and you're going to hope that this secondary continues to improve on what they've shown. That Cam Taylor Britt continues to mold into the star that we think he can be. That DJ can turn to continue to use his speed and be the, the persistent starting cornerback that we think he can be. That Jordan Battle can continue to improve on being the highest rated safety by pro football focus. That Dax Hill can continue to be the first round pick that we used a couple years ago. And as we have all that shrugging and hoping, there's been a lot of moves now that you're not shrugging, you're not hoping, you kind of know. And adding a guy like Von Bell allows for flexibility, allows for age, and, you know, he, he's still got football to play. He's still, I mean, he's, he's we talk about over-the-hill guys. He's, what, 29? Former Buckeye. We love him here in this state. Love him here in Cincinnati. It just, it, it provides so much can't be understood this is why we talk about in baseball like when the whole jonathan india stuff was going on like he's a locker room guy you you always hear that and there's no way to quantify it but for one million dollars it's pretty easy to go yeah that, that, that makes sense and that's what we're paying von bell i'm not i'm not a guy that that gets overly attached to players i will be the first to admit you guys know i defend joe burrow to the end of the earth. But I don't get overly attached to a lot of these players, right? Like, I think we can replace DJ Reader with a Tier Tom. I don't need to bring back DJ Reader. I don't, I don't need to have T. Higgins around here because I know what he is. I, I, I'm, I'm okay with going into the unknown. I didn't need to keep Jesse Bates around. I think we were all on the same page. Like, yeah, I think it's, I think it's time for Jonah Williams to move off. I didn't need to keep Joe Mixon here just because he's been the starting running back of the Cincinnati Bengals. I preach this in multiple ways, but like, just because it's familiar doesn't always mean it's right, doesn't always mean it's good. I'm okay with being uncomfortable. I'm okay with not having the familiar players. But as I've said, if you can get them on a cheap deal, if you can get a veteran that's going to help guide these rookies, then yeah, that makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. I continue to get excited about this offseason. I continue to think about what the Bengals are doing. And across the board, I have liked every move that they've made thus far. Doesn't mean they're going to miss, right? Just because you're six for six from behind the arc doesn't mean the seventh shot's going to go through the net. Just because I'm four for four at the plate doesn't mean I'm going to go five for five. In fact, it's more likely that you're going to miss soon. And maybe many of these positions will miss. I don't, I can't, I'm not, I can't put on a hat and and predict the future. I don't have a telescope that, that sees through space and time. I don't have any of that. But I can tell you why I like every move that the Bengals have made. I can tell you that when you get a Geno Stone for two years and $15 million, 
24 years old, second in the league in interceptions, and he's coming to Cincinnati a year after we talked about, oh my God, it's a dark day in Cincinnati. We didn't re-sign Jesse Bates. We're getting Geno Stone, who's 24 years old, for two years for less than the price of one year of Jesse Bates. Is Geno Stone the player that Jesse Bates is? No. You know that. But a year after we're talking about, I can't believe the Bengals didn't re-sign Von Bell. He comes on back for the veteran minimum. Love it. In a, in a room that we've been looking for interior pass rush now for two years, we get Sheldon Rankins. Two years, 26 mil. He's coming off an average sacks higher than we've had over this era. Early in his career, had eight sacks in a year. Punished the Bengals last year, playing for the Houston Texans. Had six sacks. He had three in that game. We get Mike Gusecki in a revolving door of tight end. CJ Uzama, Hayden Hurst, Irv Smith. Ugh. We get Mike Gusecki, who is a matchup nightmare for teams. He's too athletic to put a linebacker on. He's too big to put a safety or cornerback on. In the offseason, we get Zach Moss, younger, cheaper, more explosive, less tread on the tires than Joe Mixon. Check, 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 check. Oh, yeah. And we're getting another third-round pick. Get two-thirds this year. Check. This team's gearing up for something special. And if they can get a nose tackle, I love. Don't like, I love what this team has done this offseason. But that's revolving around a big if. And I know the T. Higgins stuff looms large. It seems likely that he's just going to play under the franchise tag. And unfortunately, maybe you can tag him next year and do it all over again. Maybe you can trade him next year. But that is what it is. I still have a lot of, I, I still like a lot of pieces in that wide receiver room. Jamar Chase is top three in the league. Go ahead and debate me on that one. Andre Yoshivas, sixth round pick, had four touchdowns as a rookie. Charlie Jones, athletic enough, didn't see him a whole lot, wasn't on the field a whole lot. Then you got Mike Isecki. It's There's so much to be excited about here in Cincinnati for, the, for your local football team. Casey, it looks like you got something to say. Yeah, there, there is one other thing that we haven't really discussed yet either, and that's uh, Makai Becton visiting, uh, I believe... I don't know when it when exactly the day is. I don't have that info in front of me. I thought I did. But, but Kai Becton is visiting the Bengals. Yeah. And that also I feel like is great for a depth piece too, like a swing tackle type role. Um, I don't think that should be the answer at right tackle going into the year. But, again, I feel very com confident that that number one pick is going to be spent on a, on a right tackle. Um, we'll see. Uh Thoughts on Makai Becton, though. I, I don't know what your initial thoughts are. So, Makai Becton, well, you and I have talked about this a lot. Makai Becton was arguably one of the worst tackles in the league last year, correct? Correct. Former first-round pick, 11th overall back in 2020, the same draft that Joe Burrow was taken. And his first year, once again, correct me if I'm, if I'm ever wrong, his first year was, was good. Yes, his first year was good. His first year was good. Last year, not good. Not great. But I mentioned this name when we talked about the tackle. For the money, and I've mentioned this a lot today. You got, I think Mr. Moe said I'm monologuing too much. Apologies, but I'm, when I get excited like this, I talk a lot. But I said, I told Casey about a week ago, I said, out of all the moves that you can make, I would like a risky, a risky signing at tackle. And then you draft a guy. Makai Becton has played in the league for three years now. He's been hurt for two of them. Injury prone guy. Was good as a rookie. Was terrible last year. And now he's a free agent. But you get him in a room with some veterans and, and is... Is Frank Frank Pollock? We we have a lot of conversations about what Frank Pollock is, but formerly was the O line guru. That's what everyone thought of him. Haven't seen it so much here in Cincinnati, but I digress. I think you can get Makai Becton. Do we know what his projected salary is? Five to six million for one year. Beautiful. You get a Makai Becton, five or six million. 
You draft a guy in the first round. You have a position battle. And you let it roll from there. We know that tackle out of maybe behind quarterback, right? Quarterback takes a learning curve. Tackle probably has the second highest learning curve in the NFL coming in the league. A lot of times guys struggle their first year and then flourish after that. Who's the guy for the New York Giants? He did that. Andrew Thomas? Is that his name? Who am I, who am I thinking of? Who's the left tackle for the Giants? Andrew Thomas. Andrew Thomas. Struggled, struggled as a rookie. Has been great ever since. Sometimes the guys come in and they're, they're really good from the get-go. And they Sewell. But Makai Becton makes, to me, a lot of sense. I know that worries some guys because he was so bad last year. But my move for the future is drafting a guy. This is a stopgap that maybe you hit a home run on. You got to take some swings. You got to take some swings in this free agency. You got to take some swings. Makai Becton is, is one I'm willing to take a swing on. Here's the thing, too. Um, Makai had a really bad year last year, but – he was forced to play right tackle um, beginning of the year, or that he made a transition to right tackle throughout the off season, and then as the injuries started piling up for the Jets, he got switched back to the left tackle. And I'm sure, as many of you know, with the whole drama surrounding Jonah Williams, that mm-hmm. there is a transition that happens there, right? You have to prepare. You have to get those reps in at right tackle to build up that muscle memory right well formerly he was a left tackle so they thought that that transition would be fine i'm looking here uh at some of the the comments made by him and he had he had a knee injury that caused him a lot of discomfort going into the season yeah and asked them to switch him back to i believe the left tackle spot or the right tackle spot. Yep. I, he was asked to change spots midway through the year after the, the whole uh, just the inju- slew of injuries that uh, happened on the Jets team, and it never happened. He never got switched back. So he was constantly playing on a nagging knee mm-hmm. injury that was causing him a lot of discomfort and out of position. On a, uh, I say out of position. He had learned to play one position all offseason – Muscle memory wise, then he had to flip back. So I, and on top of that, the injury he was out all of last the the, the year before twenty twenty two. He was out that entire season. Right. So getting back into football shape, I don't know. It's probably, um, I don't know if I feel comfortable with him being like I said the starting right tackle. I don't think that should be your answer. But I do think if you were to get a home run hitter, right, I do think it's with. Frank Pollock, because that's his one good season, his rookie year, a guy that's learning football at the NFL level. Right. With Frank Pollock, had his best season with Frank Pollock that year. You're telling me we're going to get that guy who is an athletic freak in a lot of ways. They call him the dancing bear. I don't know if you are uh, familiar with that. I think I've seen Spur Bear dance one time, and that was a scary sight. So dancing bear is a heck of a nickname. Yeah. And the Jets' offense was miserable. It was horrible last year. I mean, I i don't know if you can really take much of what the Jets did um, the last couple seasons and really say that that's a fair shot. Right. So I, I do think that there is a chance that he can really shine here in Cincinnati. I think you're very comfortable with him being your swing tackle mm-hmm. for this year for $5 million. Mm-hmm. And that also gives you options to, like, cut Jackson Carmen. For get, get, get yourself an extra million, you can make other options. You can do other cuts there, save yourself some money, um, get other depth pieces there. But I like Makai Becton. Um, you d- you didn't like not, him a while, as a, but as, as you swing, read into him more as a swing guy. Right. I don't think he's your answer, Correct. but he, he can turn into your answer if Correct. if things work out the way that you hope. So Alex- I think it's worth. The, I'm saying it's worth the flyer. Alex Wallace brings up a hell of a good point. Brings up a heck of a good point. When I was was when I was ranting about getting Mackay Becton and drafting a tackle, he said, "You're gonna draft a guy in the first round and not play him. You killed you killed them for Miles Murphy last year. This is what the Bengals do, right? Look at their last two draft picks: Dax Hill, who waited in the ranks, 
with Jesse Bates and Von Bell. Didn't play a whole lot. Came out, started last year, up and down. First year in the league. Then we have Miles Murphy. Didn't see a whole lot. Playing behind Trey Hendrickson. Playing against Sam Hubbard. Saw a lot of surprising stuff, I think. A lot of stuff to get excited about. Enough so that you have confidence that he's going to be more of a role on the defense this year. Has to be. He's a first-round pick. But when I talk about Mekhi Becton, it's, it's, it, you understand you're taking a risk here. You're taking a flyer on a guy that was thought of enough athletically, that was thought of enough skill-wise to be taken as the 11th overall pick. You're taking a guy that had his best year under Frank Pollock. And make no mistake about it. In the revolving door, we talk about the revolving door at tight end. We talk about the revolving door at different positions. The right tackle, we've had a different right tackle every year. 2021, it was Riley Reef. 2022, it's Lael Collins. Last year, Jonah Williams. If Makai Becton's the starting right tackle, he will be presumably the worst there. That's scary. I get it. But... You also have an opportunity for him to have the highest ceiling. You also, in my plan, would be taking a guy at the right tackle position, first round. Let's say Makai Beckham blossoms to where you feel comfortable enough extending him. Yeah, then you have a weird situation with your right tackle that you just drafted. But I think we could all agree that a little competition goes a long way, goes a long way. Between Mekhi Becton and whoever this first-round pick is to say, like, hey, we have a guy that's played games in the National Football League. And in the role where the team's number one mission is to keep this certain blonde boy from Plains, Athens, Ohio upright, to keep him healthy, maybe taking a swing and miss isn't a good call. <laughs> I'll be wrong on that one. But I like the draft in the first round with the tackles. I like the idea of taking a guy that was thought of previously high, that's had a successful year in the league before, that's coming off injuries and coming off a really bad year, and you, you, you buy low. You buy low. You pair that to, I feel pretty confident that you're going to find one guy that can at least bring the output that Jonah Williams had. That can at least bring the output that Riley Reef and Lyle Collins had. I feel like you can create that either in the draft and with Mekhi Becton. It'd be the riskiest thing that they could do, but I feel pretty confident in that. Frank Pollock, he's got to live up to that, that reputation at some point, guys. He's got to live up to that reputation at some point. Oh, man, Mekhi Becton, six foot seven, three sixty four. Have I missed any super chats? I feel like I have. Uh, Yash. Yash came in here. He's been a nut cutter for two months. He said it's a milestone, apparently. Thank you so much for being a member. Um, Casey, we still plan that, that live stream. We're going to live stream the Xavier game or us watching the Xavier game, the first half. Yep. I'm going to set it up right now. And that's going to be for all that's going to, I, yep, I, I would like to make forever. that for everyone. It's, so we're going to hang out. It's going to say, it's going to say Xavier live stream, but it's going to have the box lunch thumbnail. Cause I don't have time to make a thumbnail. So right. come hang out with us. Right. We're going to watch the Xavier game. They're going to be playing UConn. We're going to put a bet on the first half. We're going to have some fun. Uh, Robert Obright. Hopefully I pronounced your last name right. Uh, Becton wasn't getting much help last season with Wilson at quarterback. We have Joe Burrow. That's a big difference. That is a big difference, right? Raising tides. Rising tides raises all ships. When you're going from the New, Yet New York Jets offense to the Cincinnati Bengals offense, that's a big, that's a big uh, improvement. Listen, we, we, we've, all, we've all played sports. We've all been a part of groups. We've all been a part of, um, you know, communities. That when things are going well, it's easy to succeed. I don't know how much baseball you guys watch, but there's a reason that, that, that hits come in bunches. There's a reason in basketball why a couple, a couple guys hit a few shots, they start falling through the net a lot, and there's a reason why it works the opposite. To where, when you got a quarterback that, that can't do a whole lot, Zach Wilson, it's kind of hard. It's, it's kind of hard for the rest of the team to be good. When you got a team that has 
Joe Mixon and Joe Burrow, Mike Gusecki, and the rest of them. It's going to be a little bit easier to perform. But in summary, I'm getting good at saying the same thing 56 times in a row in different ways. Maybe not even different ways, but if they're able to get a nose tackle, if they're able to sign a, a guy like Mackay Becton that's worked under Frank Pollock that, that has an opportunity to improve his status, they, they were, he's betting on himself going with a guy that he's worked before, I feel so, so confident with the Bengals going into the draft. And that's key. A lot of teams are trying to fill something in the draft. The Bengals have the opportunity to go in the draft not needing to fill really anything. To where I still would like them to take a tackle in the first round. But you don't need to. Say the say you look at two, three tackles, and they're all taken early. Then you go, all right, what's next? Who's the best player on this board? Can we trade back? Is there a quarterback that people are really wanting? Can we trade back and, and get more picks? It just gives the Bengals more flexibility. And if there's anything I've learned working here at Chatterboxes, you got to be flexible, as I've been asked to, to haul video boards and, and set up high school sporting events, interview high school kids, do Miami games. you got to be flexible. I kicked off the show, what, two weeks ago? I've been hosting it for the last two weeks, and it's been, it's been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, you opened up the lines? I did. Lines are open. We are, are open for phone calls. The call-in number is right above my head it's always up there but it's not always open i'm opening them right now the call in number is 888-513-2269 for those of you that are listening and not watching the call in line is 888-513-2269 888 and then i think it's uh <laughs> five just 513 like the cincy area right, code, right. the old one like sir boy and then c box there you go there you go. Guys, uh, if you call in, I'll give you a prompt because I always think you got to give a prompt when you call in. Here's the prompt that I'll give you guys if you do want to call in. Do you think that the Bengals have the best defensive front going into next year that they've ever had during this era? Do you think it's better than 2021? Do you think it's better than 2022? What do you think about the Sheldon Rankings uh, signing? And while we wait, if anybody will call in, uh, yesterday, if you guys didn't catch yesterday's show, I went on this long spiel. First off, I, I got to admit something. I'm, I'm a man enough to admit when I was wrong. I got absolutely owned by Spur Bear. Spur Bear sat in the room yesterday. I mean, I, I, I brought a knife to a bazooka fight when it came to the Justin Fields, Caleb Williams discussion. I still feel pretty, pretty confident that they should take Caleb Williams, but man, oh man, did Spur Bear body me with facts, which I hate facts. They're so definitive. Uh, man, I got bodied yesterday. And I'll admit that. You guys brought it up. But I had to take about Justin Field or Justin Jefferson. Because um, all the rumors going around about the Bengals are going to get Justin Jefferson. Uh, Antonio Brown's talking about how it's going to happen. I said, guys, it, it's not going to happen. I hope it does. And I just said, like, it, it's getting tired. It, it's rubbing me the wrong way that we're always talking about the 2019 LSU team. I want the Bengals to kind of forge their own destiny. I don't want to always be linked to a team that already has this definitive greatness to them. I want the Bengals to do their own thing. And I hate always like, oh, we're going to get Clyde edwards Lear. Oh, we're going to get Thaddeus Moss. Oh, we're going to bring in Coach. All that stuff. It, it, it tired me. And boy, oh boy, we had a video. The video we put on YouTube yesterday did great. Had a bunch of views. The comments, oh, God, they were great. They were great. So, Casey, we're going to start a new segment. I want you to make some some quickly little jingle. Said, read, reads, read, re mean comments. All right, here we go. Here we go. Read, 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 reads, mean comments. Yeah. Nice. All right. So, here's a comment. I'm, I, I tweeted these out yesterday. They were I was cracking up. I was telling my wife these. They're great. She hates when people are mean to me. I think it's funny. Um, Christian Lobb 7030 says, who is this guy? Nobody cares what he thinks. Must be an Alabama fan. And this was the best part. was right underneath him. Dennis Miller, 3694, says, right. Who is blue shirt guy? I was wearing a Xavier shirt. Who's blue shirt guy with the bags under his eyes? Listen, I know I got bags under my eyes. I'm aging terribly. It's probably because I don't work out as much as I used to. I eat fast food and I drink too much. 
But you know what? I'm having fun doing it. So don't talk about the bags under my eyes. Uh, here's another one. Ricky Rick Terry, 9807, says, I instantly can't stand this guy. First time I have seen him, and it'll be the last time. I hope the Bengals land Justin Jefferson, and we can laugh at this dude. Nobody is here and sick of the Nobody is sick of hearing this news except this weirdo. Yeah, I'm a little bit of a weirdo. I'm a Bengals fan. If we get Justin Jefferson, that'd be great. I would love it. But I'm tired of hearing about it because it's not going to happen anytime soon. This one's from Bermuda Bengal. Bro, take your g grumpy ass for a nap. Do we got somebody on the horn? Yes, we do. We got somebody on the line. Go, I'll, go ahead and finish your, your call. Yeah, I'll do, I'll, I'll do the bits here, and then we'll, we'll get this guy on the, the call. This guy, 081, said, unsubscribed. Did this dude in the blue shirt just lose his job? Because he should frick, he freaking should. That's trash, baby. Keep raining on our parade. Hey, 081, if you pay $500 for the membership fee, I do get fired. It doesn't seem fair that I lose my job if someone just pays 500 bucks, but that is what it is. That was uh, the segment, read, reads, mean comments. But they're fun. They're fun. All right, who we got on the horn? Let's see. Am we're, I we're getting them soon? Bring them in. All right, we're bringing them in here soon. That was a really good jingle, by the way. All right, who we got? What's up, guys? Right. Mr. Mo. Mr. Mo, what's up? Do you Listen, Mo. No voice today, sorry. What? I was going to ask you. I wanted, I wanted to hear what else you got. All right. What, what do you got for me, Mr. Mo? Okay. I agree with your take on Bengals not prim prioritizing getting Justin Jefferson. I don't know about the reasoning. I don't think that um, despite people saying you don't want it to be 2019 LSU is necessarily the, the right way to go about it. But I Fair. do think that prioritizing wide receivers in that way, as you could probably tell by my chat today, Mm -hmm. is probably one of the most ridiculous things that an NFL team could do right now is overpaying and overvaluing wide receivers. I, I think that there's – yes, we are trending in that direction. I brought that up before to where uh, an elite wide receiver five, six years ago was a luxury. The way that the game is, is being played now – and we're seeing all these college guys come into the league and immediately make an impact, it's making wide receivers become less of a luxury. And I don't think that the market has has accounted for that yet. I'm on your side. Like, we look at, we look at the other contracts in the NFL. Tackles get paid a lot of money. They should. Edge rushers get paid a lot of money. They should. And then the wide receivers get paid the most after that. That doesn't quite make sense to me. I think I'm on board with you for that. Yeah, see? We agree on something. Look at that. Mr. Mo, it's because we both went to Bluffton. You went for, what, a semester? I went for four years. That's why we agree. I went for a year. One year, one full year. All right, fair enough. Fair enough. You got anything else? And we were on the same baseball team for three weeks. I do not remember you playing baseball. I'll be honest with you. Not even a little. I don't remember you that much. I think that you were mean to me, though. So that's probably why I hate you. I was a senior. I was a senior, so I was I was mean I was mean to young guys. There's no way around that. I thought I had seniority. Um, you, do you like the moves for Sheldon Rankins and Von Bell? Love them. Absolutely love them. I think Sheldon Rankins is an absolute beast, and um, Von Bell, Buckeye. Obviously, I'm gonna love him, but um, I think that him playing for the Panthers last year really hurt him because mm -hmm. I mean the Panthers were just a laughing stock of the NFL. So. Right. They made everyone look terrible except for Adam Thielen, believe it or not. Right, right. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I do appreciate Von Bell and what he brought to this city. I also appreciate, I know I make fun of it a lot, the, the, the Ohio State to, to Bengal connection, but you look at what the Bengals have done, a lot of it's been brought to you by uh, Von Bell has the big hit against the Steelers and, and plays great. Sam Hubbard has the play against the Baltimore Ravens in the postseason, and then Eli Apple has the stop against Patrick Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs in the AFC Championship game. So some of your favorite plays are brought to you by Ohio State Buckeyes. So, Should the Bengals bring Eli Apple back? Yep. Casey's should. saying yep. Yeah, they should. I haven't thought about it. We do need a veteran cornerback. Um, I do like a trash-talking corner. So we'll see. I love I don't, it. I, I love his energy. Um. Come on, you've got to have a, one voice for me today. I, I, I know I hate, I hate when people like 
treat treat you like a, a doll and pull your string. You got a catchphrase, but you always are bragging. This is coming from you. You're always bragging about your voices. You got to have some okay, impersonation. Um, do you, have you ever seen the the show? It's an old Cartoon Network show. It's um, I think it's uh, the Hunger Force. Yes, yes, Aqua Teen Hunger Force. Well, from from that Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> that's pretty good. Uh, that, that, that one's good, Mr. Mo. All right, every time you call in, you got to come geared up with a new accent or, 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 or new impersonation. If you run out of them, you got to learn a new one or else you can't call in. Deal? That sounds like a deal to me. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Mo. Uh, Casey, we got anybody else on? See you, Mo. We got anybody else on the horn? Nope, no one else at the moment. I feel bad about if Mr. Mo playing, bas- playing baseball at Bluffton. Because if he actually did, I, 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 don't, I don't remember him coming out at all. But I, I, was, I was objectively mean as a senior. I, I, I get a big head a lot of the times, as people like to point out. So I try to keep it as, as humble as I can. And, I, uh, yeah, it is, it is what it is. Um, I'm trying to think of anything. I know we have a cherry on top. It's a, a, a poignant cherry on top. But um, the, the, the Xavier game starts at 12, right? Yes. Starts to is tip at twelve. Mouse, tell me when tip is, because here's what I'm gonna do, is we are gonna do a live. It looks like Casey's getting a call in right now, but after we we, we get this caller, we're gonna do our cherry on top, and then we are gonna go step aside and we're gonna redirect you and we're gonna get get all ready for the Xavier watch and we're gonna do a watch along for the first half. We're gonna have a bet, um, and we can watch together as the uh, Xavier upsets the the stores contingent of the University of Connecticut Huskies. Yeah. I also, I, I guess I misread uh, what time the FC game is, but I guess they do play the second leg of the CONCACAF Champions Cup tonight, according to Nathan Hines, my father-in-law. Okay. I, I well, thought it was know. on Saturday, but I guess I was wrong. He would know. Who would know? Do we have somebody else on the horn? Yes, we do. Hang All on right, who we, got, who we got? Who uh, we got? Who's calling in? What's up, Reader Room? Hey, is this Sir Boy Wonder? Yes, sir. How we doing, gentlemen? I'm doing, I'm doing well. I liked it better when your your YouTube handle was Nothing Matters. It was bleak. It was ominous. It didn't feel like <laughs> Sir Boy Wonder. Can you give Can you give me the the etymology of why you you changed your name to Nothing Matters? Uh, I thought it. I thought I'd just change it up. I don't know. I don't know. Change Fair it enough. Whatever. But but um. Anyway, what I am most. It, what I am most interested in in this whole offseason is not exactly the moves that the Bengals are making, which, by the way, I find every single one of them, just like he said, check, are, check, as yep, a fantastic yep. move. Pretty good. Joe Burrow. How they approach Joe Burrow with OTAs in training camp. I what, is the one elephant, what is the one elephant in the room for the last four years with Joe Burrow? Mm-hmm. Hasn't had a full dose of training camp uh, other than obviously in 2021 when he came back from the ACL injury mm-hmm. I feel like that is such a big deal that no one really wants to talk about that I really haven't heard everyone wants to talk about that defense and yes they were not great last year but mm-hmm. I don't expect that defense to be as bad as it was last year I'm more worried about what our quarterback which is the reason why we are literally what are we top eight in odds and Super Bowl odds mm-hmm. right now? Mm-hmm. I can't I can't think of it off the top of my head. But um that is that's what I'm most interested in. I think if we get a healthy Joe Burrow in training camp, hopefully Zach Taylor does something different with his preseason games, man. I'm I they they've got to get some kind of reps in the preseason this year. Because mm-hmm. we cannot start zero and three again. Zero and four, one and four. <sighs> Right. Two and five. Right. We can't. We cannot. If we want to have success in the playoffs and we want to make deep runs every year, we have got to start the season off better than we have. And if I'm not mistaken, this is probably the best schedule that the Bengals have had since Joe Burrow's been there. I yeah, mean, they're it's... playing the Commanders. I mean, and there, there's pretty much not many. I mean, yeah, you get the Ravens twice this year. You'll get mm-hmm. the. Browns, obviously, and the Steelers, of course, and they're all going to be, I would expect the Steelers, even as much as I hate to say it, they're going to be a lot better this year. But if the Red Bengals can start off 6-2, and two, it's not it's not out of the realm of a possibility that they could get that number one seed, and I think that's 
crucial for them making long runs in the postseason this year. Your thoughts? Yeah, my, my thoughts. You, you, you threw a lot at me, so I'm gonna I'm gonna no, pick no, up. No, no, you're fine. Kind of you're ramble. fine. You're fine. I like I like talking Bengals. I like talking shop. So I'll I'll answer these in order, starting backwards. I think one of the most overplayed. Uh, conversations when it comes to the Cincinnati Bengals is about their slow starts. If you ask me as a fan, would I rather a team start fast or end or end fast? I would rather them end fast. I don't know if you've ever uh, bet on a horse, but guys that finish strong typically win the race. Um, you look at the Miami Dolphins the last two years in the NFL, they don't play very well towards the end. I'd rather be the Bengals. That doesn't discount. Like, I don't want them to, to start 0-4. I don't want them to start 0-2 every year as they started the last two years. But I don't have an overwhelming take on whether we should be playing starters in the preseason or not. I know it works for the Rams. That's where Zach Taylor got the idea. It's from Sean McVay. Um, All that being said, yes. Yes. We can talk about Sheldon Rankins. We can talk about Von Bell, Mike Asek. We can talk about all these moves. All of it doesn't matter. None of all of it does not matter if Joe Burrow is not healthy. None of it matters. Right? Jake Browning was fantastic last year coming off the bench. We all know that we can't win a Super Bowl without Joe Burrow. We all know that the reason that people think the Bengals can win the Super Bowl is because of Joe Burrow. The great quarterbacks overcome things. Joe Burrow overcame getting sacked nine times a playoff game. We want to see that stopped. But in short, I'm with you. We need to have a healthy Joe Burrow. The, the injury report that came out said he's going to be ready for OTAs. Fantastic. I would like to see Joe Burrow play in the preseason. Have we ever seen him play a preseason game? His rookie year? Maybe. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm on board with, with almost everything you said. They got to start fast. Maybe that is because they got to play preseason games. Um, very notably, the Kansas City Chiefs, they take OTAs. They take preseason stuff um, very seriously. So you should probably mold yourself after the Kansas City Chiefs. I, I, I still hold that it's an overplayed uh, thing that the Bengals never start out hot because they end hot, and I'd prefer that. Did you I know answer what? That? I didn't even think about that. That's a, no, that's a great point. I didn't even think about that because, yeah, that was – that. yeah, I almost would rather start – I just don't want it to be the whole – I just don't want them to get in. Here's my thing. I don't like the idea of regard, of relying on 10 to 13 game win streaks ending the year. Because that's, that's so hard to do. That that's is fair. so hard to do. That's what, That's kind of my – like, yeah, I, I get where you're coming from with you. Obviously, you want to end on a great note, like how the Chiefs have done the last two years. I just don't want to become – to, I just don't want to become too reliant on the win streaks because that's so damn hard to do. What they did in 2022 was so damn hard to do. Right. I mean, and then you throw on top of that, they beat the Ravens at home off a miracle play by Sam Hubbard, and then you go up to Buffalo and just absolutely destroy them as great as it was when I was there. I just, I just don't think that's the recipe for success every single year. That's right. That's where I'm at on that. But um, real quick before I go, yep. Why didn't the Titans just trade for T. Higgins and sign him the same contract that Calvin? They just did with Calvin Ridley. Doesn't make, make a whole lot of sense. sense. Thir- a thirty-year-old wide God receiver. God. Yep, a thirty-year-old wide receiver that you probably could have got for the same price as a twenty-five-year-old T. Higgins that you're familiar with would have cost you a draft pick or two. But yeah, plus I you agree. could just give him a second-round draft pick. That's all you had to do. Right. Right. If not, right. maybe throw in a fifth. So, anyway, gentlemen, you all take it easy. I appreciate it. Do keep doing what you do, gentlemen. Thank you, thank you, sir, boy wonder. All right, guys, uh, that plays for the for the show. Casey, we are we do we have a group bet? What are we riding, Casey? I, I was I was a dud yesterday. I keep betting Xavier first half overs. The game starts soon. Um, I, I don't know if it's a late start. I don't know what time the game's actually going to start. But we do need to get a group bet in. Um, put put in the chat. Pull pull question for the next. And then we'll, we'll roll the Joe Mixon thing. Something that could be live bet if the game starts after us. You ready for this? Yeah. First half over. Uh, we can't do a race to 10. Um, we'll put Xavier first half spread. First half spread. Because we're watching the first half together. Um, we'll do UConn first half spread. 
and we'll do first half under. Just do those four, and we'll see what people bet, and then we'll do our cherry on top. And by the end of the cherry on top, we will uh, we'll have our bet. Thank you guys all so much for for watching the show. By the way, I know it's become a running bit. I picked the wrong color shirt today. Um, I swear, guys, I promise I wear deodorant. I, I promise you, I wear deodorant. But look at these guys. Oh, oh, in case he it away. Sorry. You're good. That was gonna be the cherry on top. So, oh, you want to finish your thoughts? Yeah, like, look at these bad boys. Pick the wrong color shirt. I'm probably going to have to go change shirts here. But uh, Joe Mixon. This is a tribute to Joe Mixon. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, this is our cherry on top. What's going on, Bengal fans? It's Joe Mixon here. Who they? Who they? No, sir, boss, we ain't done yet. Bengals fans, you already know what it is, man. We did it. Do this every pregame. Trying to live it up. Live up the experience. Live out the dream. And this time they'll run, and it's Mixon to the end zone. Mixon drops to the outside, and Mixon is gone. Touchdown, Bengals. A 15-yard run for Joe Mixon, who has just set the Bengals' single-game record with five touchdowns in a game. Second all-time and rushing yards for the Cincinnati Bengals through a pass in the Super Bowl. Uh, a guy who turned his reputation around here in Cincinnati. We brought him in. We accepted him. Maybe sometimes some people pushed against him, but everyone that meets him says he's an absolutely fantastic guy. I, I'm so happy that we did right by him, sent him to a contender, uh, while also improving our own team. But it looks like, oh, man, we're taking first half spread, UConn. That's what the chat wants. Someone else... We only have 15 votes. We got to get more votes, guys. One like, more. Come on. Next vote. You got to get this bet in. It's about to start. Anybody. First half under 70. All right. So the I, know first, we put up, I know we put up the chat poll question. I'm not betting UConn. The first half UConn bet is minus eight and a half. Just so people know. Right. They have to be winning by nine points. Right. All right, first half under one. Thir 33 <laughs> per sit. I'm ending it. Ending it. Stop the count. Stop the count. Um, under 70 and a half. Let's rock and roll. All right, I'm going to go use the restroom, and we're going to have that game streaming here live in a second. We'll be right back. Thank you guys so much for watching Off the Bench. Uh, Tom's going to host tomorrow. So maybe I'll see you on Monday, maybe not. Thank you so much for being here for these past two weeks. See you guys.